this board meeting at uh, 3.39 to see if we can locate recording, um, okay. some recording device, and if not, we will just have to um, okay. schedule a special meeting. All right. Thank you. Yeah, I'm making an audio recording of this meeting as a, to help me remember what has happened. Okay. Um, actually, that sounds like a good opening for a discussion about doing something like that. Uh, with the one of the concerns with the Open Public Meetings Act, as it is being recorded, and the public hospital district is um, is responsible for safekeeping, and so it can all be accessed. Maybe this is something that uh, you want to step in at this time. Yeah, um, I, I think that I, I believe there was going to be a discussion at tonight's meeting about recording um, board meetings, which I think is a, a reasonable thing to discuss. Uh, there are implications associated with recording board meetings uh, that. Uh, recordings become part of the record and is um, uh, also part of the Open Public Meeting Act and Records Act. <coughs> so um, a recording provided by a hospital, a, a hospital recording for the purpose of uh, uh, records has to be um, disclosed when requested and any recording by a board member uh, according to council see if we can locate recording um okay see if we can locate recording um, okay some recording device and if not we will just have to um, okay schedule a special meeting all right thank you so okay I'll try this again um, my name is Matt Reddy I'm an elected public hospital commissioner in East Jefferson <laughs> County Washington and today I'm going to share with you a story 
and uh, see if you have any thoughts on the matter. Ready, set, go. Now, now what we're going to do is we're going to um, let's listen to a uh, commission, hospital commission meeting on March 19th, 2014. Here we are at the beginning of the meeting. Okay, so the, the, chair the chair of the board just introduced the meeting, East Jefferson County Public Hospital District Number 2, the commission meeting, and one of the commissioners, Commissioner Bueller, is absent. That is the first thing that happened, a reasonable thing to happen in a Roberts Rules and Order meeting. What happens next? Yeah, yeah, I'm making an audio recording of this meeting as, as to help me remember what just happened. Okay, okay. so the board chair uh, notices that one of the commissioners, which is me, Matt Reddy, is uh, recording the meeting. So I told them before the meeting I was going to audio record it. And she asks me, to, to confirm, are you recording the meeting? And I say, yes, I'm recording the meeting. And, and out, of out of the generosity, generosity of my heart, I, I give a reason to, to justify my recording, even, even though you don't, you don't have to give a reason. You, in, a, in an open public meeting, you can just record it. Anyone can, any citizen of the state. So, so I, I simply, since they were I was, I was actually surprised, surprised. They, they decided, decided to even like point, point it out. It, out. Um, it, it did need to be announced. Appropriate, appropriate to tell everyone that there's an audio recording going on, but I was, I was surprised she called attention to it and to, and to me about it. And then, and then I was even more surprised what happened after I said, I'm recording this meeting with, with the just justification uh, because I want to remember everything. That, that is my justification. I want to remember everything. This, this is what happened next. Um, actually, that sounds like a good opening for a discussion about doing something like that. Uh, with the uh, Commission Order Number 2, which is the Public Meetings Act, as it is being recorded, and the Public Hospital District is, um, is responsible for so it can all be accessed. Maybe this is something that uh, you want to do. Yeah, um, I think that I believe there was going to be a discussion at tonight's meeting about recording um, board meetings, which I think is a reasonable thing to discuss. Okay, okay, so, so this, this is what happens after, after I say, I, say I want to, um, I'm recording the meeting to help, to help me remember. The board, the board chair says, says something about the Open Public Records Act and is expressing some sort of concern, hands it over to the CEO who says, we were planning on talking about audio recordings of meetings. Now, now where, where did this plan to talk about audio recordings come from? I maybe, maybe the board chair and, and the CEO in response to my email announcement that of your recording said we should, we should talk about this, but I didn't, I didn't email them and say I want to talk about this. I was just notifying them I'm, I'm recording. I'm not interested in discussing it. Okay, okay sorry. sorry. Oh, isn't what else happens? Uh, there are cases associated with recording board meetings. Uh, that uh, recording will become part of the record and is um, uh, also part of the Open Public Meeting Act. 
so I'm sitting, I'm sitting there, there and he's saying there are, there are implications if, if you record this meeting. And I'm, and I'm really, I'm just in shock. I'm in, I'm in shock that, that what is he trying to do? Is he trying to tell me, is he trying to get me to turn off the recorder? I'm still not sure at this point. What are you, why are you talking about the implications of my recording this meeting? I've seen many people record these meetings before. I've never seen them get sort of like the board chair and CEO sort of I mean, like a cross examination of them about the act of recording. Anyways, it keeps going. So, um, a recording provided by a hospital, but a hospital is important for the purpose of uh, uh, records has to be um, disclosed when requested. And any recording by a board member, uh, by the council, would, would be considered that official record. Okay, so this is where my, my mind was blown. So, so the, the board, the CEO, just, just said according to council. So he's, so he's now invoking authority, council, and the, and the law, the rule of law. So I'm, so I'm sitting there, I just, I just wanted to record the meeting, and now, and now I'm being lectured about um, the authority of law that for some reason, he, he thinks just justifies uh, what he's about to do, which is to ask me to turn off the recorder, which he is slowly building up to with all this preamble. So, um, I think what the discussion tonight was, was going to go along the lines of, of discussing at the board level, and then if the board is interested um, in pursuing that, uh, to direct the administration to develop a policy, uh, a procedure, and um, uh, a methodology to make sure that we do it correctly. We, it's in line with our record retention at the public meeting response um, team, and we do it right. Uh, and uh, so I think the recommendation from the council is that absent of the hospital doing it, that so there, so there you have it. I, I think the recommendation from council is that absent the board voting to record meetings, an individual commissioner should not record the meeting. And he's saying today we're going to talk about recording the meetings as a board, and we're going to decide yes or no. And, and if we decide no, then, then no, no is the answer, and, then, and there will be no recording. That, that is what he just said. It's inappropriate for you to record this meeting right now. The board wants to talk about it, and if the board chooses to record, then we'll record meetings. If the board chooses to not record, then there won't be any audio recordings of meetings. Now, now, what, what does this do to my ability to, to know, know what happened at our meetings? I've just, I've just said, said, I'm a hospital commissioner. I, I want to record these meetings so I, so I can remember everything that's said. And you're, you're telling me that I can't, that I can't do that. that. And, you're and you're telling me if, if the majority of the board votes that, that there's no recording, that, that there, won't there won't be a recording and I don't get that. I won't get to, get to know what happens at these meetings. I won't get, I won't get to remember them, other than whatever, whatever notes I take and you know whatever minutes are written down. So, so I mean, I mean, I, I cannot remember everything that is said in a three-hour meeting. I don't have time to write it all down, and I don't have time to dispute with with the the other. Uh, uh, people in the room, the, the nitty gritty of things that were said in a meeting, the thing, you know, no waste of time and energy. You know what we should be talking about in a meeting is actual decisions, values, what do we want to achieve, what do we want to do with the power we have vested in us to lead a public hospital district, not what was said at the last meeting.
what was, what said, was said at the last meeting, meeting is a fact. It's, it's, it's truth. truth. It, it, we, don't, we don't need to dispute it. We don't need to. We, need to we can record scientific evidence of it using a microphone, which is what I'm doing. You're saying that. According to counsel, they're recommending it. And I thought, oh, so anyways, this is all in my brain. I didn't actually say this. I'm just like, I cannot believe you just said counsel is recommending that. Me, I turn it off. And this is, uh, what else happened? Well, based on my research, I don't think that's accurate. I mean, is the public meeting citizens have a certain right to record these meetings? I don't surrender that right. Because I'm the commissioner, just like you like have the right to vote. vote. You know, we have, we have certain, certain rights, 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 rights. Take, take notes. notes. I don't think it's. I would disagree with that, 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 that assessment of what is, um, what, is what, is what is legal, or that this constitutes a, a board, board act. This is a, an act of private act. citizens. Well, it, 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 okay. okay, so. I, I just had to come up with that on the fly based on my own research that because I was like trying to understand their argument, their argument being that, that me recording the meeting is um, creates a board action of recording the meeting and makes it an official record, which means then they somehow are trying to say that I no longer have the power to, to record the meeting. I have to give that power to the board because the board's will is more important than my personal will. And, and uh, more powerful, which, which is what their argument is. So I just, I just said, this is not a board act. act. This is a personal act. And uh, I was basically implying my, my personal action and personal right to record is more important and more valid and, and supersedes the will of the board to not have a recording made. Um, anyways, and then, so, and so, Pretty, pretty exhausting, exhausting yeah. to have this kind of public dispute. There's a lot of people in the room. There's, there's an audience. There's, there's like every strategic leadership members in the room. This is not just the board. This is being witnessed by uh, a bunch of very um, well-paid executives and medical professionals, as well as the public audience. And uh, this is this, is, this, argument, this argument, I'm just saying, has a big audience. Of people, of people just sitting there listening to it. It might be like a citizen, but because of your, because you are a board member, just like the notes you take at a board meeting, they are they are subject to the open public church. So uh, any tape that you make. Okay. Okay. So, so this is a bizarre, bizarre point he's making. Um, um, he's saying, saying any notes I take are subject to the Open Public Records Act. Saying, saying that if I take, take notes on a piece of paper, those. those also should be, should be archived like the, like the recording for seven years. years. That's, what, That's he what he just said. But listen, but listen they, had they had never taken our notes. Our notes. They, they never take the board, the board notes and archive, and archive them for seven years. They ignore them completely. And, and uh, so he was, he was just stating, stating you need to apply a standard of practice to the audio, the audio record, record that because, because that's, that's the standard, standard practice we apply to the notes and other written records, but we don't, don't do that. that. It, was it was a complete farce of an argument. Maybe, maybe we should, but again, again it's a selective enforcement of policy to say an audio recording is more important than handwritten notes taken. Anyways, uh, it goes on. Record is also subject to that. So it becomes part of the record. And it's a recommendation from council looking after the interest of the organization that if um, Jefferson Healthcare begins to record our meetings, that, that it be done um, through administration uh, so that we have the tape, we have the record, um, we can uh, properly store it, and we can respond to any open public meeting requests that, that may come down the pipe. Because it's a good thing. Um, it, uh, some hospitals uh, do indeed record their, their meetings, and it adds another layer of complexity to, to responding to open public record requests. So I think the ask, um, uh, or I think the discussion with the rest of the board is, is this something that we want to pursue? And then, and then secondly, if we are going to do it, uh, to do it right. And council, I don't think anyone is suggesting as an individual 
citizen, you don't have the right to uh, make the recording. But as a board member, counsel for Jefferson County is recommending you don't. Okay, so it's a very long-winded way of saying again, you have, you have the right to record, but as but council recommends that you don't, as a commissioner, because it's not in the interest of the organization. That's what he's basically saying. He's saying it's not in the interest of this public hospital district to have you record this meeting. The board will decide if it's in the interest of the hospital district to be recorded. And I'm just one board member. But I've already decided it is in the interest of the people in the hospital district to have a recording. I've decided that, and I'm not changing my mind. But he's saying you don't have the power to decide that. You have to listen to counsel, according to counsel. Again, counsel is not there. There's no lawyer in the room. This is a CEO and a chair, board chair, claiming that this counsel, this lawyer, is completely backing them up. This, this council that they, that they spoke to before, before the meeting, meeting and who after, after this meeting, I will, I will email the board, the board chair and say, could I have the, the uh, contact, contact info, name and contact, contact info for the lawyer that you and the CEO spoke to? And, and she, she will reply to me in email, which you can read on my website, readyforhealthcare.org. Ready ready she, she replies to me, if you, if you contact, contact the lawyer, lawyer you have to pay for it yourself. yourself. So they're, so they're saying, <laughs> and, then, and then, you know, six, six years, years from now, now they, they will say that, that the, lawyers the lawyers for the hospital district don't, don't have to answer any questions from a hospital, hospital commissioner, um, um, an individual hospital commissioner. They only are obligated to answer questions from the majority of the board, from three board members. So, so they're literally saying, saying you, can't you can't record, record. You, talk you talk to a lawyer. lawyer. If you, want you want to talk to him, you have to pay for it, but really, but really the lawyer doesn't have to talk to you at all unless you get a majority of the board to, to uh, vote, to, to, at, to join in and answer, ask your question. All right, so he goes on that big spiel. Now again, I have to say, no, I'm recording the meeting. In, in the interest of the organization and all the implications, the, the, the council has to make them not record meetings. I'm, I'm like, so I'm pretty so flustered at this point. And I just am like, can you just clearly say is the council, because I know I'm going to say I'm going to decline the council's recommendation. That um, in, in telling you have a policy and a procedure to make sure we can manage that reporting in compliance with the uh, open public record, um, that, uh, that we don't do it. Because it's discretionary of uh, organizations. Uh, don't have to do it. And further, what I think was going to happen is that there was going to be a discussion with the other members of the board um, to decide if that indeed is the direction they were going to give administration. Well, I appreciate the recommendation of council, but I'm going to continue recording the meeting. I think it's, I think it's a perfectly appropriate decision. I know I completely support the board um, if we wanted to officially do it, and I'm happy to do it. Um, if you feel like you need a copy and you need to store for seven years, I'm happy to provide that. Okay, okay. so that was my second or third time during this meeting that I declined to stop recording. Now, this is the fun part. Everyone who cares about this story, pay attention really carefully. What happens next? The chair and the CEO they're playing tag team here, and they're, and they're using this lawyer as part of, part of their tag team. So it's a triple team. And what are they going to do? They've asked me to turn off the recorder, and I have refused like three times. What would you do next if you were the board chair or the CEO? And you believed it was in, in, not in the legal interest of that hospital commission to have a recording, a recording made in this way. This, this is what they, what do, what do they do? What do you, what do, you do? You have, you have some options. options. They, could they could adjourn the meeting, I suppose. Or they could, or they talk, could about talk about it more with, because with, there's, there's other commissioners at the table. There's, there's 
four, uh, four there's five total commissioners and one is absent but but that means that means chuck russell and tony, and tony leo are sitting there at the table not saying a word um which is you know kind of kind of interesting just just and so this is immediately, immediately what happens next Okay. Okay. So the law would require again. He's stating stating law like he's a lawyer, but but the lawyer's not there. He really could use a lawyer to justify and explain and explain and stand behind all of this quoting of legal authority. And the recommendation from the council is that if if um, the recording is made on behalf of the organization and as a commissioner it should be making on behalf of the organization, that we have our own recording. Okay. Okay. For the first, For the first time. time in this entire, in this entire meeting, meeting <laughs> the CEO, the CEO says, says the recommendation, recommendation of, of council. Is this is a little different now. The recommendation of council is is if if a recording, a recording is made of this of this meeting, and, and you if you do it, it would be a recording, an official, an official. It would become an official recording of the meeting. But if you're going you're going to make an official recording, the organization, the organization should, should also make an official recording. He just said he just said that if you do it. He, he's, he, recommending he's recommending that they, they have, have to do it also. Okay. Okay. That's the first. That's the first time he said this. No discussion with the other with the other board members of what of what happens after, after this realization. No discussion of what does this mean. Well, can, well, can we record the meeting? Do we have the equipment to record the meeting? Could we also record, also record this meeting easily today, or do we need to adjourn and buy recording recording equipment? None of this none of this discussion takes place. Takes place. Instead, instead, this is what happens. So, so, yeah, yeah. Did you hear that? Did you hear that? So, so she said, she said I'm just, I'm just going to have to recess the meeting, and we're going to have to see if we can find a recording device. The CEO, the CEO clearly was not surprised that this, that this was the exact next step. And so then, she says, she says we're recessing, recessing the meeting. We're, uh, we're uh, going to search for a recording device. No one understood what happened because there was no discussion. It was, it was, it was a, play. it was a play. They had a, play. they had a playbook for what they were, for what they were going to do. Their play, their number, play one number one was, was <laughs> try to get try to get Matt to turn off the recorder telling by him telling him all this, legal all this legal gobbledygook. See if that see works. if that works. Try two, Try two or three times to convince Matt to turn it off. And if he, and if he absolutely refuses, then then recess the recess the meeting and and go get go get an audio an audio device. recording device because because once they, once they recess the meeting, they sent, they sent the administrative the administrative assistant in the room. Very nice, very nice woman. She ran she off. ran off and quickly and came quickly back came back with with a recording, a recording device. device. It was, still it was still in its box and packaging. She carefully, she carefully unwrapped the box, the box and took out the directions and stood there and started reading the directions to this, to this recording, recording device. device which and I, was and I was sitting there in shock, just in shock, shock that this was all happening. Um, so, they were so they were on their, their, third, their third leg of their plan. plan. I guess, I guess they, they were going to, going to then uh, have her either figure, either figure out how to turn on the recording device or not. And then, she, and then she was going to start recording the meeting simultaneously, simultaneously to me recording the meeting, and then we would, then we would resume. Now, if, now that if that had happened, everything might everything might have been fine for years to come. But but when I saw, when I saw her standing her standing there, there reading the instructions, instructions to this recorder, trying to figure out how to record the meeting, record the meeting I was just so I was just shocked, so shocked by. by Everything they, everything they were doing to try to interfere and discourage me from recording that I chose, that I chose to make a strategic, make a strategic retreat in my in my stand, stand on audio recording. I went to the, went crowd, to the crowd, found my, I found my friend who was also who was also there in the audience, and I asked, and I asked her if she would press would press record on my recording device when the meeting, when the meeting so resumed because I did turn it off when the meeting recessed, recessed didn't which I didn't have to and in retrospect, and in retrospect it would have been actually, been actually really good to keep it going but I did turn, it, I did off, turn it off and I brought it over to her and I said will you record this the rest of the meeting for me and she said sure and then I, and went, then I went back and I said 
to, to chair. I said, I'm no, I said, I'm no longer going to record the meeting. And then she, and then she told Susie to put the recorder away so they did not record it. And then my, and then my friend spoke, from, spoke the from the audience very bravely, very bravely and said, I'm going, to, I'm going to record the meeting. Is that okay? Is there anything that will stop me? And they, none of them. No one tried to, no one tried to stop her. So she, and so she recorded the rest of the meeting. So there you go. So there you go. Really, that's, really, that's all. All, everything, all that everything that happened for the six years after this is just part of, basically, basically the cover up, cover up and, and attempt, attempt to whitewash, whitewash the, the suppression, suppression of, the of the right to record in this meeting. And because uh, nothing, nothing really new is offered, is offered as a justification over the next six years for why this, for why this happens. A, a similar incident happens in 2016, but much, but much more uh, aggressive, aggressive language is used. And, um, and, um, and, there's emails, and there's emails that also, you know, you know show, a uh, show a lot of this uh, drama. But yeah, but yeah, um, there you go. There you go. That's the sort of the run through of uh, the first meeting. Stop, stop recording. <clears throat> okay, here we go. Uh, the moment in the board meeting where we were voting on the board book.
to any member of the public who wished to uh, listen to it or download it or whatever they wish to do with it. That's the way it would be handled. So again, do we have a written opinion from Brad Berg? That is from any attorney? We have a uh, this is what the protocol is. We discussed it at length with, with Mr. Berg. And, I did um, not. I never. I mean, I talked to him once. I, I'm, I'm unclear as to what your point is here, Commissioner Reddy. You asked what would happen, and I explained it to you. Do you have any kind of a motion or anything that you would like to make regarding this issue? And if not, then I'm going to move on. Hearing no such motion, I will move on to the vote. All those in favor of uh, adopting the board book, please say aye. 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 Those opposed? Nope. Okay. It goes, it's cast three or four to one. Thank you. So now we'll move on to the adoption of the board calendar. Has everyone had a chance to take a look at that? So there you have it. To summarize, the board policy book was being voted on. Commissioner Reddy voted no because the book does not adequately address the six year ongoing recording controversy that could be easily resolved with 15 minutes of competent legal advice to the full board in a transparent way so the full board could make a appropriate decision about what how it should address a moment where a public hospital commissioner decides to record a meeting over the objection of the majority of the board despite the fact the majority of the board doesn't have its own recording equipment, just clarifies what the proper professional way to handle that situation is so it's legally safe for the public hospital district. We do not want to put the public hospital district at risk by inappropriately responding to an incident where someone is exercising a basic right. So I will recess this board meeting at uh, 3.39 to see if we can locate recording, um, okay. some recording device, and if not, we will just have to um, okay, schedule a special meeting. All right. Thank you. So. So the first order of business, apart from everything else, is the minutes from March the 5th regular session. <clears throat> Has anybody got any comments? Everybody read them, I hope. I recommended one change uh, on the first page of the Washington Casualty, just reversing the Washington Casualty is a, uh, a Covey's company, as opposed to is written, I believe that uh, so Kerry Ecker with Washington Casualty Company, which is, which is a, part a of Cubs Cub 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 yes. mm. so any Anybody else, any comments? Is there a motion? Move. Can any you second? hear me out there? So, we just carried as a man. Hello, world. Aye. All right. All right. 
and it's cardinal. Hello, world. I have a patient story that I got from our patient advocates, and I know we had talked about before. Hello, hello, hello. Can you guys hear me out there? And then we're able to turn them around. That's a really good story. It shows that we don't always do everything right, but um, sometimes service recovery really works. So this is about a patient that um, had surgery. Um, was really pretty satisfied with the surgery and her outcome, but had a lot of questions and things that she wanted to talk to the physician about. So at one of her post-op visits, she asked questions and she felt dismissed. She felt like she wasn't listened to. So she called the patient advocate because she said it made her start thinking about all of the care that um, was provided. and. Um, so she just had some concerns she wanted to bring up. So, so this is Matt Reddy. I don't know if this is broadcasting, um, but I'm coming to you live over the uh, Cappy's Trails outpost radio very station. With my physician, I was free world or bust. I told him I and uh, hope everybody out there is having a great day and is enjoying these tunes of the Jefferson Healthcare recording fiasco extended play edition. The power of good Please. Uh, Really listen. Do your part in making sure that this fiasco goes on forever and is never resolved because we can use it as a tool for global revolution and transformation for the better. And the longer that people look absolutely absurdly ridiculous in positions of power while also not uh, distancing themselves from the absurd network of incompetent <laughs> corruption and a bureaucratic hot potato shuffling and laser lo uh, lazy lawyering that is going on. Uh, it's just sort of a hilarious, never ending, ever giving story of a misdeed not being uh, apologized for immediately and we move on. Um, at the first uh, after the 2014 meeting, this is what should have happened. The lawyer, the lawyer should have um, uh, contacted Jefferson Healthcare and said, I've listened to the audio recording of that uh, big con public showdown meeting where you were uh, talking about uh, Commissioner Reddy recording meeting. And I just want to clarify, although I agree with you, it should not be done that the uh, commissioner sh is not really the best situation to create to have a commissioner recording a meeting and the hospital record the meeting it's also not a good situation if a member of the public records the meeting and the hospital doesn't record the meeting and i'm aware that many many times in the past uh, people have come to the meeting and recorded it and the hospital was not simultaneously recording so all of those times i equally say you have been doing uh, bad practice so every time you really in fact i would have to say it's, it's my clear professional opinion all public hospitals yeah. should audio record their meetings as a minimum level of record keeping and so i'm sorry i didn't make this opinion clear to you i'm sorry if you want to warn you against aggressively pressuring any individual a commissioner or otherwise um, uh, visibly pressuring them during a public meeting while also being clearly audio recorded word for word in how you're pressuring them, the exact words you're saying, the exact number of people who participated in the pressuring. Um, a, as your lawyer, I recommend do not attempt to have a showdown, a philosophical or legal showdown in public with, especially with a another commissioner. Um, to talk to, if you want to have these discussions, do them in closed door meetings because otherwise, if by chance you're wrong and you find yourself in a philosophical hole that you are unwilling to climb out of using honesty and integrity, well, it's better to be in that hole with no audio record of the entire conversation, of every single layer of it in this day and age where an audio record is forever and will be available for all time for examination 
even it takes it takes you know many years before the affected parties take the time to understand what happened and to share it and to get anyone else to care about it um, it may take a while but truth has a way of coming out so yeah hope you got that and our revenue adjustments were in line with that. So generally we collect about about half, a little bit more or less depending on the month and uh, where we focus our collection efforts during that month. Um, but for, for this month, our, our collections and our revenues were in line with each other. We did not see any big settlements float through this month. In past months, we've seen either cost report settlements or Medicaid settlements, RAC audits, those things all flow through this contractual allowances line. And in uh, January, we were, it, it was a standard month when it comes to um, our, our contractuals and our revenues. Uh, looking down, most of these um, items are things that when we receive that revenue, it's in a, a batch amount. So whether we're talking about an electronic health records incentive, that usually comes at one point during the year. Uh, we did get notice that we qualified 19 providers in our clinics for their, uh, their full year of uh, meaningful use, and then uh, two more providers that hadn't attested in prior years, so we'll record that revenue. Um, while we just received notice that those, that those were approved, it actually had to do with um, use in 2013. So I'll record it, uh, I recorded those back into December. So you won't see that revenue float through on 2014 um, income statements, but you will when BZA comes to do our audit review in June. Um, and 340B revenue, the, con the program continues to grow. And I, I received a couple of questions about the 340B program in the last few weeks and why we are consistently over budget. I think one of the biggest mistakes you can make in uh, setting a budget is setting a making your budget work or meeting your revenue targets or your um, your operating margin targets based on a program that can fluctuate at any moment and also based on a, a program that doesn't happen with the services in-house so when we budget for the 340b program we take a very conservative approach we do not want to make our budget work our two and a half percent operating margin number work on our budget by counting on that program continuing to grow. When we see that number over budget here, we also see the expenses over budget on the other side. There is a, a, net, um, a net profit because of that program each month. But if you think that we, in general, the profit can be somewhere in the 60 to $100,000 range per month, we built that at the high end of our budget, we could be overstating our budget by a million dollars per year. That's not the number that we can do with those leadership team. Uh, so I, we will expect that based on the month, this may or may not be over budget, but know that we took a conservative approach in our budgeting efforts, somewhat intentionally. Looking at the expenses, um, in January was a long month, and um, it also had a, a higher number of weekdays. And that's an odd thing to consider when we budget, but when we look at a month, if we consider the number of days that are weekdays and the number of days that are not weekdays, there are higher salary expenses during weekdays. So we, expect, we expected this to be over budget uh, by about 2% based on there being a higher number of weekdays in January. An odd thing to consider, but that's how money works on paper. Uh, we also had a high inpatient during uh, days during January, which drives up our need for nursing care in ACU, ICU, swing bed, urban center, and the emergency department. Those are all areas where we saw high staffing and um, that flows through our salaries and wages. That actually has to do with the same thing for employee benefits. Our employee health plan uh, generally accrues. Um, health insurance expense based on the number of hours worked and the number of weeks in that month. So when we're working with a longer month, our health insurance expenses are higher. Over the year, that works out with months like February, but in January, those are higher, um, higher expenses based on, again, the number of days in the month, the number of days in the month, and when salaries goes up, so does benefit. And looking down there, we, um, our budgeting process, we identified needs for the hospital uh, like a consulting project. 
where we know that it would come up during the year at some point. We have all these things drafted out in terms of our work plan for the year. But if those um, activities haven't happened yet, we still have them in budget for 12 months. So for example, if we were to spend, or we budgeted for a $100,000 project, and we knew that project would happen in August, on the budget there is one twelfth of that recorded in each month. So um, when we look at purchase services, professional fees, those are all things that we uh, budget for, for um, I guess for an annual total, and the budget comes up per month while we planned on spending those particular funds in a certain month. So those are the differences that we see there. Um, and then one of the other variances we saw with leases and rentals, we did budget to lease some space during our transition plan for um, after the 1929 building is demolished. So for the next couple of months, we'll see a bit of a, a, a favorable budget to actual variance for February and March, starting in April, that will continue to go down um, once we uh, lease the space for Port Townsend Surgical Associates and for uh, the off-site location for some of our services relocated because of the building project. And then looking down, uh, January is not a taxation month, so that's where we see these um, negative, unfavorable budget actual variances. But for January, we uh, came with a positive change in net position of 255000 which is above our $154,000 budget. Um, though without the acquisition of Port Townsend Surgical Associates, that is where we should be. Any questions? So the next few slides we talked about at the past, at the, uh, the last meeting, the last finance presentation, we landed January with 44 days of cash, and that equated to about 8.3 million in in cash at this point um, we are a bit above I, I took the cash balances just a couple of days ago and um, that, that us, since our expenses were higher um, since the beginning of the year that keeps our our days in cash about where they have been for the last couple of months this just excludes the third-party settlements and at this point there are not there are no incredibly large uh, third-party settlements out there. And our days in AR. Our days in AR at this point, as of this morning, is actually 84. And I know that our, for the last couple of months, I've been sitting here and telling you that our days will be going down. There are a couple of drivers of that, and I want to be very transparent about where those drivers come from and what our plan is to fix them. So our, um, as revenues go up, uh, our days in AR will also go up. Even the counter receivable is a direct calculation of taking all of the revenue and considering how much we earn per day, and then looking at our accounts receivable. So as revenue changes, so do our days and accounts receivable. Also, there have been some delays. There's a system called is, and this system, short name, actually has a gigantic impact on our days and accounts receivable. It's where the Medicare payments flow through. So there was a glitch in FIS in the first week of March, which caused a weak pause in the FIS system. So knowing that that, that happened, it, it paused, it kind of delayed all of those collections for the hospital by one week. So that gained three days of accounts receivable right there. In the last couple of weeks, my entire dedication, aside from the audit, has been on reducing days and accounts receivable. And we are working with a couple of vendors to figure out how we can get the backlog taken care of. When we look at this, it has stayed, stayed steady since in September. It's not gone down a bit. So our team in the business office is doing an incredible job staying current. The issue is that the backlog that happened when we went live with Epic is considerable. And while we can stay on top of all of the claims that we are receiving and keep our days and they are consistent, working a backlog of essentially 30 days of accounts receivable is a, is a difficult task. So we are coming up with a work plan to figure out whether it is additional employee time or working with um, vendors on our older accounts receivable from our commercial carriers or Medicare to try and just work through the old things. There's an issue of manpower in Fort Townsend, and I think we know that. We don't have the ability to call in the billing squad and 
you know, who, who have experience with EPIC, who have experience with uh, critical access hospital billing, to come in and work through all of our claims. So we are looking for that with an outside organization, just as we did when we went live with EPIC. And that would help us just get the backlog worked. We can keep on top of what we have now, the backlog. And most of those claims are Medicare, so we have a high, a high collection rate on those claims and commercial claims. Um, our self-pay collections, while they are getting older, um, we generally do not collect on our self-pay collections as much as we do for our other, our other payers. So a February snapshot. Uh, February is a short month, so generally when we look at a, a month of revenue, we hope that the revenue number starts with a 12. So looking at, at February, while it looks like it's a low number, we have three days less than we generally do in a month. So what we're looking at here, Epic is divided, or I guess all of our hospital revenues are divided into three systems. One is called HB, hospital billing, one is PB, professional billing, and one is home health and hospice. And that's where all of our revenues come from. HB is where about 98% of our revenues are, are uh, come from. The only places where PB happens is in our clinic in Fort Ludlow and Fort Townsend Physical Therapy. So all of the revenues across the house, those are a very small percentage. They're all clinic visits. There are no um, no ex ex imaging services, any of those things that happen through the PB system. And home health and hospice, a um, couple hundred thousand dollars a month, maybe three. Um, but the majority of our revenues float through this HB system. So this is where I first look at the end of generally every day, to see where we are in terms of our targets. So for February, we landed just under 11 million, which averages uh, 392,000 a day. Our budgeted volumes are 405,000, but that includes Fort Townsend, Physical, uh, Fort Townsend Surgical Associates, the revenue that would be driven from that. And not just from the clinic. Uh, if we think of all the, the revenue that happens by acquiring that practice, uh, we also have the surgery related revenue so that's why you know, the difference of those is actually favorable for us because we uh, if we think of in a month what can be generated by a surgeon is certainly higher than a seven seven thousand dollar gap between these two numbers in a day and then looking at cash our average in february was 181,000. our goal is 190,000. so this uh, looking at what happened with fizz looking at what happened um, with some some of the, the charge related questions that we are still working through with Providence's help on how EPIC is built. We're still, we're staying where we need to be. We're a bit under, under our target, but we, we definitely have an action plan. And March in the, <laughs> in my world. So uh, March and April, we have our financial statement audit next week. Uh, EZA will be coming from Spokane. They'll be on site all week. And it's a fairly intense process. They'll also be working through our Medicare cost report and the Medicaid cost report. Uh, meaningful use. So we filed our meaningful use uh, attestation for the hospital for our EPIC system at the early parts of October and all information was submitted in late October. There was a gap. We didn't hear anything for a while and didn't hear that they were doing an audit. We have uh, communicated with them and we now know that they're in the process of reviewing our file. So I expect that by the next meeting, I have a very clear understanding of when we can expect that payment to come through. That will significantly change our cash position. The original estimate um, is somewhere in the three, three and a half million dollar range for our, our payment back from the this week we did our standard and poor's credit rating. So they uh, go through each year. Last year we were um, assessed with a triple B plus rating. And this year I don't see I don't see changes coming down, but because our balance sheet is not as strong when it comes to accounts receivable and our cash position, that may impact their rating. Uh, we also issued more debt last we issued some debt last year for our Epic system. Our, we're also working on securing interim financing for the construction loan to build the emergency specialty services building. The way that the USDA loan works is that the USDA pays off whatever construction loan we have when we take occupancy of the new building. So it will actually be a construction loan for the, 
for the building process itself, and then USDA refunds the construction loan source at the time we take occupancy and uh, meet the USDA requirements. Is so that process going through? Yeah, right now it's sitting on uh, First Federal's desk, and it's gone through their, I guess their round one of review to see if they can be competitive on rates and if they can uh, finance the entire construction loan process. I don't see any holdups in that, and the communication with them has gone really well so far. So the process has been pretty smooth. Yeah. Does FHA reimburse us for the interest or any of loan costs for the bridge loan? Uh, so any interest that happens during the, the period of construction is capitalized interest, and that was part of our project cost. Okay. So um, while it isn't cash back, because they kind of assign that portion to us in our Jefferson Healthcare's contribution to this in cash, um, it was part of our entire the application that we sent into the USDA, it was part of that. Great. So all those, the, the accounting way to do this is that any interest that you would um, incur during the construction loan is amortized the building. So the average life, which is usually 27 years. Uh, focus on reducing days in AR. And then we also are working on our statistics gathering process across the hospital and figuring out how to do this in a really streamlined way. And that will get us back on track for the, the red and green flash reports that um, I showed at board meetings up until everything changed in the world of Jefferson Healthcare. But we're getting back there and we're learning a lot about how to get the information. So in the next few months, we can expect to see those statistics start coming back. It'll start slow, but we'll get there. And we will have um, a, a comprehensive list of statistics for the board each month. Do you have any questions? It's a lot of information, Brandon. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned um, when you were talking about billing and uh, accounts receivable that you're consulting with Providence. And I'm curious what uh, Jefferson Healthcare's connection to Providence in that regard is. Sure. It's all okay. Yes, we don't usually take, we don't usually answer questions, generally comments, but. Uh, uh, Briefly, I think it would would be sure. Well. sure. Was the comment on something that she mentioned? Yes. Yeah. But we but but then usually somebody gets back to the commenter, and oh, so okay. with the information and, and that's the usual way we do it. But, okay. That's, that's but fine. if you want to go we, ahead, quick. we purchased our Epic software from Providence through their Community Connects program. So um, when we have open help desk tickets, for example, they Providence is the one that that solves those open help desk tickets. So when I talk about hangups in the billing system or with a specific insurance carrier, um, if there's a technical change that needs to happen in the software, Providence, that's what we, we have kind of a work plan for them. Is that a service we're paying for through our maintenance agreements with them? Yes. Great, thank you. Is there anything about, you said you would have a quick controller? The controller will be starting on March 31st. Yes, <laughs> we'll be having my own party. Um, so we're really excited to welcome him to the team. Good. Thank you. I'd like to thank you and your team for all you're doing under our almost impossible circumstance under this it's transition. <laughs> so I assume the countermeasures for increasing cash on hand and uh, catching up on accounts receivable are the same as at the previous meeting. They are. Um, so work, work in progress. Work in progress, yes. Yep. So I think we should note that cash on hands and uh, number of days of accounts receivable is, is still not at the board uh, documented target, and I recommend approving. Well, we don't have to. We don't have to approve approve anything because we've already had the financial report. Oh, it's not a financial monitoring report. It's actually yes, but, but it's not the annual. It's not an annual, which is, I believe, what we were. We, it's just a report that we are presented with. I don't know that we necessarily have to approve it. You know, we haven't been, as, you, as you're well aware, we haven't been following uh, the Carver governance strictly, and that's why we're having a workshop uh, in April to review all this, because some things, we, we modified it prior to you coming onto the board. And so there's, there's no reason, really, we're, we, Reviewing and reevaluating how we use the governance, as you're well aware. But, but I was just going by 
the board policy that says well, I understand we that monitor one. those two well, items and monthly we we get the financial flash report. I yes, assume we what I'm saying to you is we've not been following that, as you're well aware, and that's come up, and we, that's why we're having a two-day workshop. But I appreciate your point. Thank you. So are we not monitoring uh, reports at all at any monthly board meeting? Uh, we can, I don't think we need to, unless it's, some, unless it's a, a something that the other board members, I mean, just jump in. Well, we haven't been. And we haven't been, yeah. The, our, our governance policies aren't something that was brought down to us from the state or from anybody else. It's something we impose on ourselves. And, uh, and they're in a state of flux right now. We, we schedule meetings to unflux them. <laughs> Is, is, is that the dictionary? <laughs> <laughs> Matt, just one comment too is these reports, um, I presented the, the, the targets that you're talking about, mm -hmm. those were presented in February. Mm -hmm. So those, the slides I think were <laughs> in terms of however it was uh, titled, but the information that I shared today, those few slides were, they weren't different. Okay. But I'm hearing we're never going to, or at least until we decide, we're not currently approving monitoring that, reports. That is my understanding cities. from what was agreed, you know, prior to you coming on the board, and then we we sort of we've toed and froed, and so that's why general consensus was we need to get this sorted out, and we have two meetings, as you know, in April. The plan for April, and we will. Uh, with someone who is uh, trained in governance will help us decide as a board where we're going with this. Excuse me, Madam Chairman. I feel that all my questions are being answered in advance of my questions. I feel that we're being adequately informed of the status of the operation of our board and of our organization. Thank you. Do you have any comment? Move on to quality. And, yes. I have I had a question about the previous report. I'd be more than glad to wait for an answer offline. Okay. But I did have a comment slash okay. question. I would like to know how much of the accounts receivable was due to that six months of uh, non-collection. I'd asked that question at a previous board meeting, and I didn't get a response. You've never had a that. response. Okay. So I, I appreciate a response once your audit is over. <laughs> Thank you. Can I ask a clarifying question? Um, what uh, are you looking for? One member of say accounts receivable over a certain age, or are you asking about what? Can you clarify your question? There was a whole bunch of money that was well, I don't know how much money, but some amount of money was unbilled for about six months because of okay. some problems with ethics. That's, <laughs> that letter that was up to That's the amount that I'm looking for. Okay. A rough number. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. So now we move on to quality and patient safety report. So this is actually a combined report. I'm going to do the quality and patient safety report, and then I'm just going to do a um, strategic plan mm -hmm. update, which is about quality and patient safety and patient satisfaction. So starting with our core measures, core measures are those measures that are required by Medicare. They're publicly reported measures. We've been doing this as all hospitals have been collecting this data and making improvements for 10 years, more, more than 10 years. Um, this is recorded on a website called Hospital Compare, which is a CMS website. Um, we, what we did, we used to give this very, very busy report to the board um, that had a lot of red and green. And what we decided to do is do a composite score. So this um, represents all of the indicators under each of those core measures. And the core measures are stroke, heart failure, heart attack, pneumonia, and surgical care. So you can see in here that um, heart, heart attack, we've been at 100% for four quarters. For surgical um, care, we've been at 100% for three quarters. Our challenge right now is stroke, and we took a little dip down in both pneumonia, but that was just one patient, and we've corrected that. 
um, but we also took a little dip down in heart failure. So those are the areas that we're drilling down on. So stroke, um, the areas that we did not do well, it's, um, it's very prescribed the type of education we give patients regarding stroke and we didn't have all the elements in that, so we're correcting that right now. Um, we also, it was felt that there's a certain amount of education we have to do for the staff, so we're working on that, um, and have provided a lot of education with them to drop down on this measure. And then we have to give advice on smoking cessation, and we did not have a good way to document that, so we're working on that. Um, and the heart so can I just ask one oh, sure. So if you go back to the, the um, previous <coughs> slide, so or maybe come come back to what you're going to. So of the 80 percent, how many patients, or, or how many is the, the 18 18 percent not met? It's is it um, one patient or ten patients? Or? It's the, I believe that the data for this um, for stroke for the things that we didn't meet. Um, where it was a very small amount. And that's why, you know, one patient can, because this is discharged patients from the hospital, and many of our acute strokes go to um, Swedish. Okay. That's, you know, it's, it yeah. is, it's the, you know, it's the curse of small numbers. Um, and so for heart failure, it was really um, one patient that did not get any documentation of their um, heart failure status. And there, um, so that we've already worked with the hospital on that. And um, the discharge instructions that was one patient, it was a new nurse that didn't hand out the correct booklet and we talked to her. So, um, it, again, small numbers and it really drops our numbers when we just lose one patient. Joyce, can I ask on that? Basically, we're talking about these are incidents that cause negative you know, outcomes for the patients. There was no risk to the patient. This was just more of an educational and paperwork issue. It, it was, yeah. None of these really, none of the areas that we missed. Now you could say you know, when we, if, if in our pneumonia measures we drop down on our ability to give our antibiotics within an hour of the patient arriving, that could have a negative outcome. But none of these, um, you know, the, the stroke education, I guess we didn't prepare the patient as well as we could have for how they take care of themselves when they go home. So uh, all of it has, uh, could have safety ramifications. Process measures, as opposed to outcome measures, process yeah. measures, um, theoretically, if you do the nine steps in the process that are deemed best practice, that you'll more reliably get the highest outcome. So that's why we pay attention to making sure we give the right pamphlet. <clears throat> we um, participate in something called Partnerships for Patients with the Washington Hospital Association and they send us um, data and this is our data for um, the, the, it's actually quarter three uh, this year, that's the most recent data that we have and I'm very happy to say that this is us and lower is better. So this is on um, central line bloodstream infections that we have. This is an outcome measure and we had zero of those and we've been at zero for quite some time. Right floor. Um, so very happy not to be one of the hospitals over here. One of the hospitals over there. Um, this one is our catheter associated, associated urinary, tr urinary tract infections. Again, we've been at zero for quite some time, and there are all bundles that you follow and things that are best practices to get these outcomes. And we also monitor that to make sure that we're meeting all of those um, bundle elements. Um, this one is, oh, that's the repeat. This is our um, surgical site infections, and we did have a blip up in surgical site infections um, that, that were reported on our total joints. I'm happy to say that this, this quarter and the next quarter, we've been at zero. So um, we did a lot of work around that. Laura um, Showers is our infection preventionist, and she really spearheaded an effort with surgery to really improve that and, and it's, you know, we still hold our breath, but you know, almost two quarters with no infections um, in those cases has been very reassuring. Um, and then this is what I was talking about. We, we've been doing, um, working on ventilator associated pneumonias for a long time. And I'm an old ICU nurse and it used to, 
be a given that if a patient was in an ICU and um, was on a ventilator for more than two days that they would get an infection. And if you would have asked me, you know, 20 years ago, if we could prevent that from happening, I would have told you no. But um, the Institute for Healthcare Improvement did a really good job of researching this and the bundles for best practice for ventilator, preventing ventilator-associated pneumonia has really worked and hospitals across Washington State are reporting, um, some of them reporting two years without a ventilator-associated pneumonia. We're, this is a, a showing that the bundle that we use to prevent we slipped a little bit in using the bundle element since we went live with our EPIC system because we have to change a lot of the screens to be able to document the, those areas. So this is just to show you that um, we, while we still haven't had a ventilator associated pneumonia, we need to make sure that we don't. So we're really um, kind of going back and hardwiring this again to be able to meet all those bundle elements. And this one is, let's get close so I can see it. Um, this is a, a new measure, which is, you know, where we do participate in something we call the um, OB roadmap, or, you know, fo following best practices for um, <coughs> deliver safe deliveries. And this one is... Um, PPI. A PPI, thank you. <laughs> um, so knowing that we're not, we're not doing that, and that's a best practice, so we're the hospital down there. And then this one is uh, falls with injury, and we did have one, and one is with this lift right here. So this is our hospital. It wasn't a severe injury, but it met the definition of an injury. We do everything we can to prevent patients from falling in the hospital, and I wish I could say that we have eliminated it, but we haven't. And as you can see, um, there are more falls registered on this than infections or anything else because it is a constant challenge. And of course, with our small numbers, when we have one fall, it gives us a pretty high blip. We have a falls team that works on this. We um, are, you know, we continuously, it's continuously on our, the forefront um, in trying to resolve it. Probably the, the average age of our patients is somewhat older, which yes. they're always more prone to. Yeah. It should be noted that the, uh, we are doing a, um, we started a project to reduce inpatient delirium, which mm -hmm. is very much tied to falls. Yes. So people get confused, they hallucinate psychosis, reactions to medication. So there's actually kind of new best practice to reduce that happening. That's one of those things like, you know, ventilator associated you know, just, you, you just thought, oh, well, you know, so many patients on ventilators will get to my, the, uh, used to be the thinking, well, you know, there's you hospitalize there there people who are older, there's just, you know, yeah. some of, you know, the, they're going to get confused, and we're kind of fighting back on that now, saying, well, you know what, maybe we can do more, and so we're actually participating. So hopefully that'll be another besides the fall prevention team that actually just by doing the delirium, uh, the work to reduce that should actually hopefully, you know, also keep that fall risk down. And this is pressure ulcers, it's stage three or four pressure ulcers, and we, we're at zero for that too, um, for this particular quarter. And this one is, um, Pulmonary, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> this one's pulmonary embolism, and we are at zero. And this was one that we did have a really good blip, a really blip two quarters ago, and really drilled down on every single one of the, those cases. And one thing that we now are looking at very carefully is this comes from CHARS data. So it's done from abstraction from the chart. And um, if if it's not coded properly at discharge, um, then it's gonna count in our numbers. So, because the last time when we had several of them, three of them were um, present on admission, so they really shouldn't have been coded as hospital acquired. So we were watching this very closely, um, our numbers are really good. And this is a, this is a big um, the, uh, Washington State Hospital Association initiative right now is to reduce this because it, I mean, it, it is a bad outcome for the patients when you see the This is our readmission rate, and um, we're at 16.6%. This is within 30 days, and the national rate is 18.4%. So we've consistently, except for one quarter, been under the national rate. 
one of the things that we're doing that we're hoping will continue to reduce this is home health is, is seeing every patient after they're discharged from the hospital one time in the home. We don't bill for that, but at least they can go out and do medication reconciliation, make sure the patient's taking the right medications and kind of look at the home to make sure that the patient is safe. Um, so that's something new that we've started and we think that will continue to reduce readmissions. So, so we're at 8.3, did you say? No, we're at 8.3. Oh, wait. Yes, yeah, we're at 8.3. We're at 8.3, 8 8 so we're yeah, on behalf of the National Library. Yeah. I think that's just with our, our base. Is that our base? Sorry. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. So this is the strategic plan update. Um, I'm responsible for part of the strategic plan, not all by myself, but um, I'm responsible for reporting on it and making sure it happens. And my part of this is to elevate the patient care experience. Um, so some of our um, quality of care metrics, one is to improve immunization rates for our patients. And this one is, I don't have data on this, I tried to get it, but um, we, we're still collecting the data. But we did take a little bit of a, um, we, we lost some ground when we went with ethics, so we're working on um, really getting that documentation. One of the things that happened was what happened with our old system that doesn't happen is there were um, cues for the nurse to remember to give that and that's not happening with our EPIC system. So um, right now we have the case managers working on those kind of improvements as, as, for, as we work with our EPIC screens and try to get some of those cues back into it. Um, Include the swallow screen. This is one of the growth indicators and one of the ones that we were lower on. Um, so this has been a big push. Um, patients that come in with a stroke sometimes are unsafe to be able to even swallow water and are certainly unsafe to, to get medications by mouth. So we require, and it's a best practice to, for the nurse to do a swallow screen before they give any liquids. And we really struggled with this, and in fact, at third quarter, we were only up to 50% compliance. Fourth quarter, 100% compliance, so we continue to work on this um, because it is really a safety issue if we don't do that. So, so a bedside nurse does that? They do a screen. If the patient screens in, then they order speech to do a um, full assessment, but they don't, they hold liquids and don't give pills until that assessment is done. They would have other means to get the medication. And then fully implement the sepsis bundle. And I'm just, um, this is our new team. Dr. Um, Tracy Harris is the physician champion for this. And it, um, we're working with also the State Hospital Association. This is called the LEPT program. So um, it's another one of their programs that we participate in. So these are some of the things that we will be doing. We've already started our interdisciplinary team member of uh, meetings. Um, we're calling now a code sepsis, so that or a calling a rapid response team so that we get people deployed where the patient is. Um, one of the things we know if a patient comes in with a bad infection and, and they have signs that they are septic from that bad infection, getting the antibiotic in as quickly as possible is one of the um, most important things you can do besides supporting their blood pressure um, to um, have a good outcome for the patient. So that's really the purpose of getting a lot of people there so that we can get all the things we need done for the patient and get that antibiotic in as quickly. So that would also mean a lab, fast track to the lab and all that stuff. Right. Um, and then again, uh, other things are ISO certification. We are going to have our DMV survey sometime in April. And this will be our ISO certification survey and Laura's gonna talk about that in a few minutes. Um, introduce team care. This is a new initiative for us, really. Um, we're all in this together. It's a team effort to be able to keep our patients safe and um, give quality care. We're going to be doing tw team steps training, which is a teamwork training. So we've got some staff going over for um, train the trainer um, at the University of Washington at the end of the month, and then we'll come back and train more, and then we'll start our training for all of our staff on team steps. This is a nationally recognized program. I think it started with the Department of Defense. Um, and it really um, is a lot about communication and how um, 
how we're able to communicate with each other in times of stress um, to help keep the patient safe and do the right thing for the patient. We're gonna, um, we're going to, um, we're going to become accredited for our cancer program and it's a lot of work to get from where we are. The American College of Surgeons does an accreditation um, for cancer services and we started, we have our cancer committee established and we're working on compliance with those standards. And then expanding our emergency preparedness plan. We have a team working on this. Um, we're gonna start doing um, drills, a lot more drills than we did before just so that we can really show how ready and feel confident that we're ready in the case of um, a disaster, um, national emergency. We do really well in the ER if we have a rapid influx of patients and that's really defines, what defines a, a disaster is um, a rapid influx of patients above your capability to be able to handle that. And um, we've done a good job you know, if you get a multiple um, vehicle accident or um, just the big influx of patients that we've had at one time with several critical patients. Um, mm. But we don't, we, we, um, we don't drill it enough. So when we have this happen, we tend to be able to mobilize everybody and, and take care of the patients. But we haven't had the kind of disaster like, um, that we could have, like an earthquake or th something that would bring more patients in than that, and so that's what we really need to drill to and make sure that our plan is um, watertight. Question for me on your emergency plan, that includes internal and external mm -hmm. both? It does. We participate in external um, disaster drills, um, but most of those have not been with an influx of patients. They've been a paper drill, and or they call it tabletop drill, and we want to do a drill with an influx of patients. Because that's that really is the way to practice it. Um, and then el eliminating never events, and that's the falls with injury, surgical side infections, mislabeled specimens, anything that really are high risk um, that do cause patient harm. Um, so one of the, I'm gonna show you a couple graphs in just a minute, and then ensure safe medication <coughs> practices, improve our culture of safety, one of the things that we've renewed are executive rounds and we're being consistent. All of the executive team is going to different areas and talking to them about what they're seeing, what they need, you know, how, um, you know, are there issues around patient safety that they need help with. Um, and it is, that is a best practice in um, really kind of improving the culture of safety. And then we do a survey and we'll do to do the survey again in the fall. So um, we've done this every year, um, and we saw, we've seen every time we've done it, we've seen improvements in at least the perception of the culture of safety. And then decreased hospital acquired delirium, and that was what Joe was talking about. Um, so I'm gonna just give you a few graphs on how we're doing. So one of our meditation initiatives is um, use, use of our smart pumps. Um, we purchased smart pump software about eight months ago. And, um, but it's only as good, it's only works if the nurse uses it. So, um, and it, it's a few extra steps for them, but it really is, it, it, it has the, a dictionary built into it that has m almost all of our medications in it. And then it has hard and soft, uh, hard and soft stops. So if a nurse tries to program in more medication than the patient should get, it will tell her that or tell him that. Um, so we started out with a struggle in compliance, as you can see, and we're not where we want to be, but we are definitely improving. And the pharmacy's done a lot of work with the staff. There are some issues where, you know, the, it's, they can't find it in the dictionary, um, and so we're resolving those as we go along, but still a lot of work to do on them. Our target is 95%. This just shows you the, this is just our acute care unit. Um, this shows you our emergency department and they've certainly had their ups and downs, but at least the trend line is going up and so we're really working on that with them too. It does take ex extra time, but it is really one of those safety features that we have to use. So we can use a stress test and work on it. Um, this is our um, medication barcode scanning. We started this when we started Epic. 
So we scan the patient, we scan the medication, and it, it will alert us if we're not giving the right medication to the right patient. Um, there have been issues with this that have caused the compliance to not be as high. You know, the bar, they can't read the barcode. Um, in the emergency department, a lot of times it's an override because they need to give it right away, and they're, you know, so they can't scan it. So we're, we continue to work on that. Um, Medical Short Stay and Pharmacy and um, the emergency department are having huddles with the uh, pharmacy every day talking about these issues to resolve them. So I think a trend line would show that we're going in the right direction, but we still have work to do on this. This is a process um, measure, but we also know that if we don't do this, that there's the potential for bad outcomes. And we would hope to see our any medication errors reduced from the use of this. And then delirium, um, Joe talked about, um, there's a lot of things that we can do um, to help reduce delirium. One of the um, things that we do to patients that causes delirium is wake them up frequently in the night and draw, draw their lab work at three and four in the morning. Um, yes. We give them drugs to we make give them, them sleep. We give them drugs to make them sleep that also make them confused and we have a lot of noise at night. And so there are a lot of things that we can do to help um, reduce this. So Dr. Geese is one of our hospitalists, is our team champion, um, and our outcome measure, this is given to us by the state, is restraint days. Not the greatest outcome measure, but they're struggling with trying to find a better one. One of the things that we are going to do is a standardized test that we can give the patient um, to, to kind of level, measure their level of delirium too. <coughs> One of the things that we've learned, and there's a lot of new literature out about hospital-acquired delirium, is that patients don't easily get over this. So if they're in the hospital and they become delirious because of the environment, it's sometimes eight to 10 months um, out before it's resolved, and sometimes it doesn't fully resolve. So the hospitalist went to a conference and heard this and said, we've got to fix this. So we were happy when the hospital association um, had this as one of the um, their lead things that allowed us to work with them, which gives us a lot of the tools that we need. One thing that comes to my mind is that when the shift changes at 11 o'clock and they report at night, so it's about midnight before the oncoming nurse gets a chance to go and see her patients, as one of her patients, and do the eval. So, most people are in there trying to get to sleep before that time. Right. It's I know the whole hospital process and what we've set up is not all it's that not patient conducive friendly. to the patient. No. no, it's not. It's it's our convenience. So we're looking at all of those kinds yeah, of good. things, and you know that the hospitalists are identifying patients that that could just sleep at night and not be woke awoken um, frequently. So looking at the you know whether the vital signs that we go in and take and turn the light on and whether that's necessary to do it as often as we do. So just as reducing it as much as we can. I, we never get to a point where we uh, won't have interruptions at night, but if we can reduce those and give some good solid sleep, that would be good. Um, and then this is just the, the report card that we'll be using to show how far along we are. We started it in January, so we, um, we got to see some great numbers pretty soon. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's, it's a work in progress. And then patient satisfaction metrics. One of the things that we've done is we looked at our Jefferson University and made some changes to it. Um, our inpatient satisfaction decreased, and we're drilling down on that right now. One of the things, we saw a 14% decrease in scores compared to two quarters ago, or compared to quarter two, um, for inpatients. We did see an 11% increase in satisfaction in our emergency department, and that is a hard thing to do. The decrease in the inpatients, we are looking at that. Um, it's pre-epic to post-epic, so that um, may be one of them, one of the reasons. We also had, we had trouble getting our data from epic to our company that does our patient satisfaction scores. 
And we made the choice to go ahead, because this is publicly reported, to go ahead and try to catch up with that. But it meant people got surveys <coughs> several months after they were hospitalized, and our patient advocates got calls from people that weren't very happy, and I don't blame them. Um, so that may have also affected some of our scores, but we're drilling down because we own it. And it may not be any of those reasons, and we need to figure out what's happened. Um, the 11% increase in our emergency department, one, our director down there is really good at sharing information whenever she gets a complaint um, with the staff. And we're doing follow-up phone calls after patients are discharged from the ED, and I think that probably has really made a positive impact on the satisfaction with the emergency department. But Picker will tell you this is really hard to do, to see that kind of an increase in, in the emergency departments, which are tough places. Joyce? Yeah. Do you know how we compare to the median of comparable institutions? I, I do, and I, you know, hospital compare, um, I presented that, I can't remember what meeting it was in, but I presented it at a previous board meeting, and what, on the hospital compare website, you can pick out different hospitals that you want to compare yourself to. So I always compare us to Harrison and Olympic because they're the closest to us. And we have been consistently much higher than they have been in almost every score. However, I don't know what will happen when this data hits because that data is always several quarters behind. Um, on our picker, we can, we can get our peer ranking. We can get it for small hospitals and we can get it for the whole picker database. Um, and I don't think that quarter is not, I have to click on it to get that, but I can provide that information. Yeah. Just be happy to. We, we have been living above um, average and median, but with this drop, it takes us right to, uh, it, average for hospitals our size is 73.6, and we, were at, we fell down to 73.8. But that's not where we have set our goal. No, and we've consistently, for overall satisfaction, been above the 75th percentile of the picker database. So in that, um, that's where we hope that we can get back to and even improve more. So, so, yeah, was, so your feeling is this most probably is due to ethic and the complaints you've gotten, all the advocates have heard from patients being upset about the surveys and that sort of I think some of it might be, mm -hmm. although the first quarter that we went live with Epic, our scores were a little bit higher than they are this quarter, or the last quarter. So it may, I mean, I, it could be the difference. I mean, we have to change all of our workflows, and maybe some of that spilled over and the patients felt that, and were less satisfied with the care. And then when Epic, when we first installed Epic, we had 50% um, more people working and getting our staff on board. So. So it's since they've been yeah. back on their own that, that it could be. so there's a reasonable explanation for it. But we're going to really drill down on this. Yeah, and, good. You know, we huddle every two weeks and we share progress. where we are with this. Because mm -hmm. we get a rolling three months, so I, yeah. can, I can always give them that data. Yeah. And then our patient and family <laughs> advisory council, we have interviewed and selected five community members, and we're in the process of choosing our four staff members. Um, our first meeting will be in May. So we're excited about that and just moving ahead. Any questions that we didn't already answer? Any questions, Chuck? No. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. So don't don't get too comfortable, Joyce. Do I come back? Well, strategic. Um, sorry, no, Laura, Laura, Laura Shower, sorry. Yeah, Laura Laura comes up. Sorry, I was just trying to give you a hard time. I don't have another <laughs> I was trying to make you a horse. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. Talking to Ms. Laura, uh, that, that we are maybe a month away from our third DNV survey. And um, what's interesting about this next DNV survey, uh, when you commit to that uh, quality improvement methodology, you uh, commit to uh, ISO accreditation. And uh, the first two years, you ramp up to that. But the third year, in addition to the Medicare um, uh, compliance survey, is the ISO accreditation. So it's more rigorous. And Laura um, uh, has been leading the charge to uh, get us to ISO compliance. And 
Um, I asked her to give a presentation on um, both the survey and the work she's doing. Um, well, so I saw an opportunity to tell people about ISO, and I, I thought the board hadn't heard um, about it, so I had this. I have information. There's information about ISO. So um, ISO doesn't. It doesn't stand. For, it's an international standards organization, but that's not really what ISO means. Anyway, it's it's a concept that came out of other industries, and it's been uh, adapted to healthcare. And it's a it's a model for continual improvement. It's a quality management system. I'll tell you a little more about it. So it's an infrastructure, an organizational infrastructure. And we are currently meeting requirements of the NIHO standards, which are the CMS standards. Um, and so what we've done for the last three years is met the, the requirements for that. What ISO does is it adds requirements for internal auditing, management review, and preventive and corrective action that incite accountability. And so what that does is we, we audit, we see what we're doing, we look at what we're doing, we change things, and then we re-audit, and we have continual improvement. So with ISO, um, the ISO standards is a very um, small document. Uh, it's, uh, there, there are eight groups of standards, but it's a very small document, and they don't tell you exactly what to do. They tell you what it needs, what it needs to look like, but it leaves the how up to us. So we use our own innovation to determine how we best will do it to get better patient outcomes. So what we've done is when we first, we first got accredited and had a planning phase, we've been developing systems and we're implementing systems. And so in this, in our, in, in this year, we've been really working on conforming and then we should be getting certified, hopefully in April. I'm sure we'll get certified. Hopefully they'll come in April. Um, so uh, the path from NIHO to ISO for us, like other hospitals, is that um, we have a lot of policies. You've seen a lot of data. There's a lot of reporting. There have been a lot of things done in hospital systems. Um, ISO doesn't mean that we have to redo everything, but we do need to look for gaps in, in how we do things. So um, I've been looking at our document control, our calibration, how we manage our purchasing systems, how we identify and trace our equipment, um, how we control non-conforming or broken or products that don't work as well as, as they should. Um, I've been doing internal audits and then uh, developing and training to corrective and preventive actions in the organization. So um, over the last year, I've audited uh, pretty much all of our departments, all the clinical departments for sure. and. Um, in this, what I do is uh, prepare the director or the leader who's gonna be audited in the department, and then I do their internal audit, give them a report. In that report, we celebrate successes, we try and promote positive, because there's, throughout the organization, um, there, uh, we have a lot of innovators in Jefferson Healthcare, and I've been really seeing that. Lots of evidence of innovation and um, incredible desire to do the right thing and do well. It's, it's been really quite fun to audit the departments. Um, but then generally everybody has a, something that they have to change. Um, so that's called a corrective action. And then I'll show you an aggregate of the, of the, the data that I've been um, delivering to the management review team, which is our executive quality council. So we have our internal audits, we do our corrective and preventive actions. Our management review includes the results of the audits, customer feedback, um, uh, performance conformity, the status of the preventive and corrective actions that people should be doing, um, follow-up things that would have need to should have been done, changes that might affect us in the future, recommendations for improvement. And then the management review team needs to approve outputs. And so the outputs, we hope, will improve the effectiveness of the system, um, if, improve our customer satisfaction level, and then and primarily to by assigning resources where they need to be in the organization. So the clauses in ISO, uh, the management responsibility is for, um, they need to be committed, customer focused, they need to really think about the quality of policy and have objectives, really align responsibility and authority, and to get a good review of the things that um, the audit information that are coming their way. And then the other clauses in ISO 
kind of circle around and improve quality over time. And there's more of a, a representation of this. So the management responsibility is to align resource, resources where they belong um, so that we can uh, realize products. And for us in healthcare, the, the product realization is, is well-being, patient well-being, health, good recovery, um, satisfied customers, people coming out the other side um, feeling better for the work that we have done. And then we need to be measuring, analyzing, and improving, reporting that back to the management team, and then doing that circle over and over again. It really should be based on customer requirements and what's important to our patients. So our Patient Family Advisory Council is going to be a huge boon to, the, to our ISO process. So um, they're the top management that um, in the organization includes the board and um, is defined in, their, in, our strategic, in that executive quality council though includes primarily the administrative level of, or, or our strategic level. And we should be reviewing inputs and outputs in those groups and then aligning resources as I said. So um, we have been doing that. We've been completing the cycle of audits and we're, we're, I think we're prepared for our um, ISO audit. And so this is a timeline given the years. And so we got accredited. We had our pre-assessment. We had our initial visit. We had our um, ISOs. We'll have our ISO certification this year. And then the cycle continues. And the, the benefit, one of the benefits of the DMV um, accreditation as compared to like Joint Commission accreditation is that they come every year. So and considering the ISO standards, we have to be in a continual state of readiness or improvement as compared to with the Joint Commission, it's often like getting ready for an exam and a lot of cramming goes on and um, pre preparation at the last minute, which isn't real true quality. So for us, um, I've been giving reports to the board or to the Executive Quality Council and I was counting up the total number of non-conformances and I stopped doing that because there are a fair number of non-conformances. But what I have found is that we have, out of all the clauses, including the NIHO standards and the ISO standards, we have 25 er or 29 areas that we are meeting the standard. And it's, it's not surprising. Um, the top three or four clauses and areas where uh, is are, are these, and I won't necessarily bore you with those, but one of the biggest issues we have is document control. Uh, we have some issues with control with our non-conforming product policies. Um, so what I do when I deliver this to the executive team is I ask for, I, I try and ask for resources. And so we now are looking at a more definitive parameters uh, for our document management, and leadership has assigned a team um, including our PI department and our quality department to try and establish those parameters. Um, so I, this is just an example of a document that I created for leadership who have the onerous task of taking um, all the documents. It's, uh, it's difficult to imagine all the documents that there are in this organization. And I've been working here for a long time and have been involved in a lot of documents, but I had no idea. I mean, it's just amazing how many documents we have. So it's going to be a big project to pull those in and change the structure that we've had. Um, so this is, a, this is just some first steps for clinical leaders to find their documents, sort them, organize them, inventory them, and then we'll apply standard templates to them and standard processes for storage of the documents. Um, so at our department level, the, it's important that the mid-level leadership, so I've been talking about what the executive leadership needs to know, but the, the mid-level leadership and direct care staff need to know the ISO standards that apply to their areas. They should know the six quality policies and follow them. And so um, we've had, I've been attending staff meetings um, at, at the unit level and have been doing direct one-on-one -on -one coaching with our directors and our mid-level leaders to, um, to work on these and to learn this. And I feel like there is, understand it's light bulbs are definitely going on. There's, it feels like there's quite a bit more uh, awareness of it. Um, and then our strategic plan that Joyce just went through um, is really integrally involved. We are required to have a quality policy 
and the quality policy, of course, will be updated every year, and our new strategic plan will be added because everything that we're doing in our continual improvement needs to be to be planned and executed in a um, an, an organized fashion. So um, we want to use that as a as our guide. Laura, this seems a little contradictory. Earlier, you were talking about ISO standards not being really standards, and we're supposed to be innovative and invent things as we go along the way. And now you're talking about the standards that apply and six policies and things. I, um, it seems like it's... That's a good point. Um, so the, the standards are that we need to control our documents and records, and we need to do corrective and preventive actions and a few other things. And so ISO says that we have to do that, but how we do it is up to us. Um, so, um, for example, with controlling documents, we need to be sure that our documents are well organized. And how we organize them is up to us. We don't have to buy a certain program, software program or do it in a certain way or make it look exactly a certain way. That's up to us. Um, what, we, what we pick for the, the um, operational things that we're working on is up to us. We need to, just, uh, we need to apply the ISO principles to the improvements that we put in place. And they do, they do dictate some of the policies that we have to have, or the quality policies that Laura is talking about. That is spelled out. They don't tell you how to write it, but they tell you what needs. They tell you how to write it. Yeah. Did that answer your question, Chuck? Mm -hmm. Sorry. Um, so the ISO mantra is to say what you do and do what you say. And, um, we do have, we have a really good story to tell at Jefferson Healthcare. I'm very confident um, about our survey. I think that there will be some non-conformances. There will be some things that we, that they'll tell, when they leave, they'll leave us a list, a to-do list. Um, but we've been on a course of continual improvement here for years. So, um, and that, it really shows in the audits. And I think that um, it will be easy for the DNB to see that when they come. So that's the, to do. Any questions? When they leave uh, and leave us a list, is our uh, accreditation uh, contingent upon us meeting those standards, or will it be AMA when they walk out the door? It depends on on what what they find. <coughs> so there are different levels of nonconformances. If there are lower level nonconformances, then we get our certification, mm -hmm. and they just when they come next time, they want to see that we fix those. If it's a higher level one, it may become that may be a contingency. Thanks very much. That was interesting. So, the Chief Medical Officer, please, Dr. Myron. Hello. Uh, a couple quick things. Uh, just want to let you uh, make you aware of the next sort of big uh, administrative uh, and technical hurdle facing the medical staff, which is ICD 10. Um, so, ICD 9 is the set of codes that every medical diagnosis has a particular code. Nation, nationwide, everyone has to convert to ICD-10 by October. So that's the bad news because all these codes which are um, uh, required uh, and are used for everything from billing to quality data, um, the number of codes is expanding uh, by a large amount. Um, and so it's, it's been a transition that a lot of people have been uh, dreading. That's the bad news. The good news is we're starting practicing with ICD-10 six months uh, ahead. So um, starting in April, we're actually going to be, uh, through EPIC, we'll actually be practicing using ICD-10 codes with ICD-9, um, which is great so that we're not at the time where actually everyone has to convert over. We're not suddenly starting to try and learn how to use these codes. So we're getting a head start. So the training has started. Uh, Corey Osbell's uh, been working with the medical staff to um, get them prepared. We now have our set of training videos that uh, should help get folks uh, used to, to what they're going to see. And the other piece of good news is that this is actually something that looks like Epic is going to do pretty well. Um, there's actually, they've built in uh, programming to help make the conversion from ICD-9 codes to ICD-10. So we think that um, you know, with the head start as well as with the technology we have that we're going to be in a good place um, to, to handle that. But to make you aware that that will be going on and uh, that's it. Could you, could you give an example of how different detailed, I mean, I've heard some bizarre stuff. Like, yeah, there's, there's the bizarre out like, there. Like bitten by a shark. Yes, yeah, I believe the most bizarre was um, um, 
type of burn while water skiing was actually the, the most bizarre. I read the same one. Yeah, that was, I think, that was actually on NPR to kind of uh, illustrate. Um, right, and we could we could debate sort of the, the benefit of having what level of detail. But just an example in your everyday. Every day, probably, um, there's some things that won't change at all, and then the, um, uh, in primary care, we expect about 25% of codes to change. In orthopedics, there's a higher percentage, a lot of musculoskeletal, and that's partly because there's gonna be more determination of left versus right, so a lot of laterality. So um, when you uh, put in a code for a person who had a, uh, a rotator cuff tear, it won't simply be rotator cuff tear, it'll be rotator, care, rotator cuff tear left versus right. And then also there's digits that, is this the first episode of care or is this a follow-up episode of care? And um, so that's- post-operative episode. Right, exactly. So there's, there's all different uh, codes that <coughs> add additional detail there. So, um, so there's definitely, um, we'll so see impact <coughs> in, in some areas more than others, but once again, trying to give people a head start and having the right technology to support it. Is, is so it's the provider who has to come up with this with the correct one? Right, so a lot of the, lot of the coding takes place on the, on the front lines, particularly in the outpatient clinics, so that's, that's where the diagnosis is, is picked. And so any, anything that we can do, because it's hard enough to know and keep up with medicine and then try and keep track of a bunch of um, numbers and digits that uh, uh, relate to, to the work that you do. And so um, when you have technology, if you, some technology that can support you in doing that, it, it makes a big difference as opposed to, I, I, I actually, would fear doing ICD-10 if I was on a paper system because I would need a big book of, yeah. and uh, a whole other set of training. So, um, do you think this will slow patient care down? If you have to expand. It'll be if, or every you no. Know, I think you know. Issue? No, I don't think that'll be an issue. I think it'll be a few more clicks with every patient that's uh, seen. Um, so it's, uh, it'll be time consuming then. A little bit, yeah, and I think we'll have a better sense. I mean, I think that's one of the advantages of the six-month lead-in is that we're going to have a sense of, of how that's going to go. The way that the technology is set up within Epic um, and with the training, we don't think it's going to be a big, you know, it might add a few more minutes to the day at the end. Um, I think it's just more sort of, uh, it's one more thing. That, uh, so, and um, uh, I wanted to follow up, uh, last time we talked to, uh, we talked provider engagement and uh, talked about metrics, and I was gonna come back and I was gonna give you sort of my, my target metrics, but then um, uh, I had mentioned before a burnout assessment, and I'd, I'd done some work with HR to see if some of the, uh, the people that we contract with for the um, provider engagement, if they do particular survey work and burnout, and they didn't really have something that was, I think, a right fit for uh, what I want to do. So I'm actually going to use a separate scale that's actually documented in the medical literature to kind of uh, take a look at our staff. And I'd rather get that data first before I kind of say, and I'd rather look at the data as a whole and talk about sort of what, what kind of work. And um, particularly after conversations I've had with the providers, and couple patient advocates, and sort of where our staff's at. So I think that's kind of an important thing. So I will be getting back to you. I don't think that I forget about it. Yeah, and then the uh, last thing too, uh, I, I wanted to bring up, uh, um, one of the nice things for the last few years has been um, medical staff stability, particularly in the primary care world. Um, you know, we've had a, a staff that's been here for a while and um, has worked well together, and unfortunately we're going to have a big hole to fill in the next few months, and I don't know that you're aware, but it's, it's, it's knowledge now in the public, but Terry Day is going to be leaving our organization uh, in uh, June, and we're in the process of starting recruitment to uh, find a, um, a member to join that practice to, to take care of patient load, but we're, uh, we're really sorry to be seeing uh, Carrie leave. Um, yeah, I am too. I yeah. mean, I'm sure we all are, because she's yeah. just a great asset yeah, in the community, been, and she's just a right. super person. Yeah. Been here for over 10 years, yeah. uh, and uh, so uh, we'll be, uh, you know, I think as we get closer, we'll be talking about ways to sort of uh, kind of celebrate her and yes. say her mom, and I'll also fill you in more, but let you know that as soon as we knew that was the case, she has a very large practice, and we immediately uh, started looking as a way to uh, find an individual to uh, join that practice. And mm -hmm. So pretty. She'll be missed. Yeah, she'll be. absolutely. That's it. That's it for today. Thank you very much. So, Mike Ben? You should just follow up on ICD-10, the biggest predicted impact ICD-10 will have on a hospital is days in accounts receivable. That, that um, most of the uh, consultants who are helping hospitals prepare for this are saying that the, the uptick that you predictably see when you implement a new EMR, you see when, you will likely see when you go to ICD-10 because it 
two, two things need to happen. It needs to be coded correctly at the physician side, provider side, and then the coders need to take that and, and make sure that it, it is indeed correct uh, and corrected if it's not. And there will be a learning curve there too. Uh, so that's an, an added uh, concern, I think, industry-wide about ICD-10. And that is why it's been, it's been delayed and delayed and delayed and delayed because it will have a real impact uh, on hospitals' uh, financial viability uh, during that period. And also, um, so ICD-10, the 10 was originally intended to be 2010. Oh, wow. Yeah. Um, and the, the, I mean, every year there's an update, and it's usually not that small, but when they decided the 10 would be so large, then it just kept getting pushed back and back and back. So it's kind of a coincidence that it's a, a 10 after the 9. Um, it's not an indication of version or you know, upgrade level. It's <laughs> supposed to be four years ago. Um, but a lot of things are coded on the front end, like uh, claims that happen in a clinic setting. So that's one um, one code that needs to be assigned by the, the practitioner. But as we think of anything that happens in the hospital setting, a lot of those procedures have more than one code that goes with that. If we think of an inpatient stay, um, and all the things that happen while a patient is at the hospital, each one of those procedures has a different code, so um, those are all the things that would be detailed line items on, on the initial bill. So, so one digit off and? One digit off and it's rejected by the insurance company or Medicare, and as challenging as this is for our hospital to figure out, um, even with the resources that we have and training and help from Providence getting the EPIC system up and going, it doesn't take out the component that insurance companies are also struggling with this new reality. Um, so we will be testing bills going to every carrier that we work with uh, to make sure that their systems are working effectively as well. So if we jump back and think of um, any change in the billing system that's happened, and I go back to 5010 that happened right when I got here, early, very early 2012, um, that that caused a delay because while we were doing things correctly, we got over our hurdle, but then we couldn't get over the Medicare hurdle because they hadn't fixed, it fixed it, yeah. their side. Mm -hmm. So it's a it's a challenge in having a six month head start with coding on our side. And our, our coders are doing the same thing that Dr. Madden's talking about. We'll be running dual coding for six months, but the challenge will come making sure that all of the payers are equipped to accept those new codes. And to complicate matters, certain payers are not moving to ICD-10 at the same time. So they'll be requesting ICD-9 codes, potentially in addition to the ICD-10 codes, knowing that they don't have the resources and the technology to switch their entire system over. It's so, something like a 400% increase in coding in the number of codes. And not everybody's going at the same time? Well, most, most insurance companies are, but some of the smaller carriers are not. Or they're only, while you have to attach an ICD-10 code, you're required to include the, the related ICD-9 code, which causes a hiccup in our system, in any <coughs> billing system, because you only have one spot for the code. You don't have two. So it will be tricky. Luckily, the, all of the large payers are going, but we think of, I mean, we, we have 20 main insurance companies that um, we file claims with, and then there are all of the others that float through and then once a month. So it will be a very challenging experience, so. Another headwind. Uh, a couple of other items on the administrative report. Uh, the work, uh, completing the slight modifications to the uh, surgery center um, is underway in anticipation of Jefferson Healthcare uh, acquiring PTSA April 1 and running it as part of our system. Uh, which we are all very excited about. Uh, nursing Skills Day scheduled for March 21st and 31st. And I think that's been, or March 24th and 31st. And I think that's been something that's been going on for about 10 years. Mm -hmm. I think Terry Camp started that. And yeah. Great idea, works very well. A lot of uh, education to a lot of people in a very short period of time. Uh, our financial audit. Um, and Medicaid cost report is also scheduled for next week. Ton of work leading up to that, um, uh, completing 
uh, the 2000 and closing the 2013 year. Um, and I suspect a whole lot of time in the next week or so with, with Tom. It, uh, I know that they are meeting with me. Are, are they requesting a meeting with the board? Usually we talk with the board chair. Board chair. Okay. okay. All right. We, we'll schedule that. Um, in the addition of to your health that's going to come out, I think Monday maybe? Next week it should um, be delivered to Sound Publishing. Okay. Um, it's um, it's uh, a typical to your health with uh, interesting and informative articles about Jefferson Healthcare, but also an annual report that uh, a bunch of numbers, uh, kind of by the numbers of, of, um, of what we are doing here. And we tried to model it from other small community hospitals uh, annual reports, so I think it'll be uh, in, informative. And we have our second annual athlete symposium uh, that is scheduled for uh, April 12th, and that's the, the kind of kickoff um, event for the roadie run. Um, that uh, uh, provides, I think there's a, um, a whole set of different uh, um, presentations on everything from concussion awareness to uh, um, sore joints to uh, how to exercise uh, into your twilight years and not and do it responsibly with cardiac issues. So if you're uh, if you're around, feel free to stop by the hospital on the 12th. I think it'll be wonderful. And lastly, Human Resources is taking on this huge project um, where we, we, are, we partner with uh, a third party to help us administer our retirement and pension plan. And um, uh, over the years, with the hospital's contribution to employees' pension plans and their deferred compensation contributions, um, that's up to like $30 million. So um, the third party administrator or the, the firm that um, manages that for us has, um, has a certain price point. In other words, they provide this product, uh, this set of products and, and charge uh, by virtue of you know, percentage of pennies um, uh, with each transaction, uh, a certain price. And so Heather and her team are um, putting, out that, putting that up to bid to validate that uh, the, uh, the administration of those plans uh, provide as many investment opportunities and options uh, for our employees that we feel they need, and also that um, the, the, these firm, this firm is sharpening their pencil and uh, ma making sure that uh, the, the buried charges for those services that, that we don't see in the form of a monthly statement, but our employees see by virtue of backing out of, of their statements um, are, um, are market-based. So if, uh, big project, um, but I'm, I'm happy to see that done because, you know, I, I, uh, this has been in the, in the lay press recently um, about how, how the different retirement plan administrators that you need to be aware of that and, and actually encouraging employees to go to their employer and ask about it because over the course of, of a 25 or 30 year career, plan A versus plan B, um, uh, it's, it's 30, 40, $50,000 uh, to, okay. to an employee based on high, high charge plan versus a low charge plan. Um, and the way to think of that is, is if you buy an index fund and, it's, and the load rate is uh, next to nothing, versus a, uh, you know, a, a um, some sort of um, proprietary man mutual fund and the rate is uh, significantly more. So I think it's a great project and one that's uh, uh, very employee friendly. That concludes my report. Thank you very much. Now there is board business. Is there any, are there any reports? Any Information in anything but uh, no reports, but even though it's a short session, the state legislature approved a bill that was supported by the Washington Association of Federal Hospital Districts, uh, Senate Bill 5964, requiring training for elected officials in open public meetings and open public records. Uh, it's currently on the governor's desk awaiting signing. It's being, uh, implementation is being assigned to the Attorney General's office, and he's work, they're working with the MRSC and the AWPHD. The question uh, kind of pending now 
as to whether it's only going to be applied to new, newly elected um, officials or all officials. Mm -hmm. And at the next meeting, I would, I would like to entertain a motion that by resolution we request the state uh, attorney general's office to have this applied to all elected officials. It'll take, the, the act takes effect July 1st, and under the act, any newly appointed, a newly appointed or elected person has 90 days from the time they take office to comply. It's apparently going to be, very possibly going to be by electronic means, webinar scenario, type scenario. So it's not gonna be a real painful thing. And there'll be a requirement in it that you have to research every four years. Okay, good. But I, I would like to see us come out in support of all elected officials. Has to include state elected officials. Um, <laughs> they, so, just the I'm recording. Yeah. I'm recording. Let me not. Well, it's not our policy, is it? Wait, is this an official meeting? It's the an official board, board meeting, but our policy states that we record when we're in our normal. It's the last time we had a retreat, we had an agreement, but then, you know. But the re kind that of agreement is, has been recorded. Correct. Right. But it's on it's on record. But still, um, you know. So we could add something, um, maybe the add between the second and the third paragraph that says something to the degree of um, that board should follow a, a general practice of not responding to individual public comments at the time they are made. The board chair will have the... Yeah, I think that's a reasonable... I think that, that still gives us leeway, but it tells what... Yeah, the general. Yeah, the general. Try this again. Um, my name is Matt Reddy. I'm an elected public hospital commissioner in Je East Jefferson yes. County, Washington. And today I'm going to share with you a story 